essential reading for seekers of inspiration and spiritual empowerment. This series offers nourishment for those on a path of increased awareness at this challenging time. Inspired by higher sources of wisdom, Chronicles of Hope delivers messages to lift your spirit with a roadmap of hope and guidelines for living a life of expanded consciousness. The guides offer powerful insight for mental, emotional, and spiritual growth at this critical tipping point for humanity. The message is clear. We must change. We have the power to raise our vibrational energy individually and collectively before it's too late. I am Lois Herman, author of the best-selling Chronicles of Hope series and host of the Inspiring Hope radio show at WSMN.live or 95.3 FM. You can find me at LoisHerman.com or ChroniclesOfHope.net. Welcome to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman, a leading expert in professional coaching, clinical hypnosis, and energy clearing. Lois is an award-winning author of Chronicles of Hope. She has decades of experience in advanced hypnosis techniques, has conducted highly effective success coaching programs that have helped clients discover ways to achieve success, empower themselves, their families, as well as holistic practitioners to expand their practices. Get ready to be empowered with your host, Lois Herman. Good morning and welcome to Inspiring Hope. I am your host, Lois Herman, and I'm here to inspire you with positive messages and celebrate people who are making a difference in our world. When we focus our thoughts and energies on truth, honesty, and integrity, we create powerful shifts that cause us to be more positive and peaceful. If we each do what we can to make small shifts in awareness, we create ripples of hope. Join us as catalysts for positive change for our families, our communities, and our world at large. I hope you're inspired by today's show. And I just wanted to comment, I saw a quote the other day that rang really true to me right now. Take your foot off the gas and don't push yourself so hard. If you need a rest, then take a break. The world won't fall apart if you nap. Renew, dear one, you are a treasure. Be gentle with yourself. How many of you are actually able to slow down and pause even for a moment? Your health, vitality, and sanity may depend on it. We try so hard to do the right thing to take care of our home, our family, our gardens, our pets, and often our health is last. Sometimes we just must listen to our body and pay attention. <clears throat> As Dave said about permaculture, we must observe our environment and accept feedback to understand what the plants are telling us. In the same way, we must take the time to listen to what our bodies are telling us and take appropriate action. There are times to take deliberate action, <clears throat> excuse me, which may mean time to rest, recover, and be quiet. It's all about achieving balance. And I know for myself, I've had my foot on the gas these past months, pushing very intensely the complete book three, The Archangels. And I'm very excited to have the proof copies to show for all of my passionate work. Yet in the process, my physical health has taken a little bit of a toll. A couple weeks ago, I was invited to a team event that I was told involved bike riding, and it was for all levels. Well, without understanding what was truly involved, I found myself in an incredibly intense, high-impact spin class. Now, I haven't been on a bike in over 40 years. With my thrice fractured or dislocated tailbone, I'm uncomfortable sitting on any hard surface for any length of time, let alone being cleated to a stationary bike with a rock for a seat in a dark room with my slow-moving, fluffy body, surrounded by action-loving action svelte athletes. After an hour of sitting sideways while slowly attempting to keep up, I was unchained from the torture device and could hardly walk. Two weeks later, my back was so out of alignment, it screamed at me, what have you done? You're far from 30 years old, okay? And you're not even close to a conditioned athlete. What were you thinking? Thank goodness for Dr. Jim Peck, who is helping to get my bat body back into alignment as I slow down, pay attention, take time to listen, to rest, and focus on my health and recover from my own self-inflicted injury. So Dr. Peck is in the studio with me to chat about what he calls rational health, 
which means many things. One is pay attention to yourself and avoid doing stupid, irrational things that have real consequences. We often attempt to do the right things on a regular basis, yet end up doing certain things that are destructively detrimental. Enjoy this fun song he brought to, uh, to our attention from the 70s that speaks to our choices. Organic cooking, I always ask for more. And they call me Mr. Natural, on down to the health food store. I only eat good sea salt, white sugar don't touch my lips. And my friends is always begging me to take them on macrobiotic trips. Yes, they are. All but night I take out my strong box that I keep under lock and key And I take it off to my closet where nobody else can see I open that door so slowly, take a peek up north and south Then I pull out a hostess Twinkie and I pop it in my mouth Daytime, I'm Mr. Natural, just as healthy as I can be. But at night, I'm a junk food chunky. Good Lord, have pity on me. Well, at lunchtime, oh, you can always that's from Larry Grossi. You guys need to to watch the whole whole YouTube. It's really funny. So Absolutely. thanks for being here with me, Dr. Jim. I'm delighted to be joined here. He's a holistic-minded chiropractor who believes that our bodies have the innate ability to maintain health if we only live rationally. <laughs> <laughs> so grateful to have you here to share your insights. So tell us just a little bit about yourself. You've been on the show before, but for people who haven't heard, well, Lois, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Sure. And uh, basically, I've been a chiropractor since 1978. I went to school and studying in 1974. And uh, I practice in Andover, Massachusetts, where I have the pleasure of practicing both with my wife, who runs the office, and my daughter, who is also a chiropractor. Um, we w still work full-time. People th sometimes marvel because I've been practicing for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's been a wonderful joy. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm just going to say this because I've been I've been seeing chiropractors for over 30 years, and I've seen probably 30 different I don't know many different chiropractors, but oftentimes they will when I go in they treat me the same way every time. I I have certain things about my body that are out of alignment regularly. If I bop my head, sure. my whole spine is out. But they have a pattern that they almost always use the same pattern. And I have to say when I go to see you. <laughs> it, all bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> you have so many varieties of techniques that you use based on what's wrong with me at that moment in time. So I'm, I marvel at, at all the different things that both you and Dr. Audrey use. Um, and it, it just is amazing. So thank you for the work you're doing. Well, thank you. And I think I learned from the School of Hard Knocks, because when you go to chiropractic school, the way you learn to become a chiropractor is you work on each other, especially when you're not very particularly competent in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my four years of chiropractic school, I probably was less healthy and happy than I was at the beginning. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way I'm going to do this to people. So mm -hmm. I studied a lot of alternative ideas of how to do adjustments without being quite as traumatic or, or mm -hmm. stressful on the body. And uh, I think it's worked well. Yeah. And, y and I, I also... We forgot to mention this before. I want to mention it right up front. Is uh, they also Jim also does pets, so he does. Uh, and I I've actually sat back when we were having to sit in the car and couldn't come into the office. I've actually watched someone pull their car their pet the dog out of their car and the dog couldn't even walk. And you adjusted the dog and I'm sitting here just waiting for my turn and watched as the dog all of a sudden started galloping around wagging their tail it was amazing to me and why wouldn't they be out of alignment like we are so that we can be so it's amazing that you work with tell us a little bit about the well, pets before absolutely. we get into rational health well again going back mm -hmm. to my past um in 1975 at the beginning of my education Consumer Reports came out with a two-part issue about chiropractic, and it was very negative. And mm. it basically the best thing they said was, well, millions of people go every year. They go because you rub, they rub your backs, and they talk to you, and they convince you you're getting better. And I'm kind of convinced that I'm not brilliant enough to get in the psyche of the pets to convince them they're getting better. <laughs> and I've had quite a few that were paralyzed that could mm -hmm. walk afterwards. And one of my favorite stories happened about maybe nine, ten years ago now, where a person brought a, a dog that was a combination Basset Hound and German Shepherd, that had become paralyzed when they were vis up in Canada visiting. And uh, 
the vet up there, which they went to as an emergency, said, it's time to euthanize this dog. And they said, oh, I can't wow. do that. This has been a lifetime pet. The family has to say goodbye. So when they came back, the woman happened to be a, a cash register at Market Basket, and she was crying about how that night she was going to be taking her dog to the vet to be euthanized. And uh, somebody in another row that was coming down overheard and said, well, try Dr. Peck first. And so they, they drove in the next day in, in a hatchback and opened up the hatchback, and here's this dog laying un, unable to move. Mm -hmm. And um, I did an adjustment. I said, come back tomorrow. They came back tomorrow. The dog saw me, got up on his front legs, and dragged himself away from me. I adjusted him again. I said, come back tomorrow. And, of course, the next day, the dog got up on all fours and ran away from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. And yet, he, he lived. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I also want to acknowledge that it's painful to lose your pets. And because, you, Jasmine, you just lost your lifetime friend this week. So my heart goes out to you. Absolutely. You have to focus on the wonderful times you've had with your pet because <coughs> that, that will never be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, uh, I lost my old man cat last year this time, and we created, we buried him it right outside of our kitchen window, our kitchen garden patio, and we created a memorial garden to him, got a little statue of a cat where he always liked to lay. And so it's growing in beautifully now, and then we ended up several months later getting these twin kits that keep us entertained. So <laughs> he's here with us in spirit. And they will always, uh, I see, I have a little thing that I've put out there that says cats leave, pets leave paw prints on our hearts. And that is so true. Oh, yes. And that's lovely because the one thing we always want to remember is we're not replacing a pet when we get another. No. We're simply having another wonderful pet in our life. Because mm -hmm. they all have different personalities. Absolutely. Yeah. Very different personalities. <laughs> They're all in their own goofy ways. And they, <laughs> and they keep us entertained and they fill us with love. Because they are unconditionally loving. Absolutely. So I love that you you work on cats, dogs, horses. Yes, uh, most anything. We also, we've worked on birds. Birds? No fish, though. <laughs> now, well, actually, I have a chiropractor friend who adjusted a fish, and it responded really well. Really? That's interesting. <laughs> he tells oh. quite an interesting story about that. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I just wanted to slide that in there because I've known people who've said, well, my, my dog got stuck in, you know, under a rock, and he's having a hard time moving. Well, the, duh, something dislocated. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, so it's, sometimes it's as simple as that you know, to us, but I think that they need to look up Dr. Jim Peck. <laughs> yeah. So tell us, you wanted to talk about rational health. What does that mean? Well, that's an interesting question. First of all, to start, I wanted to bring up that we have a health crisis in the United States. Yes. That, um, last year, we spent $4.3 trillion on health care. It's actually the number one cause of bankruptcies in, the, in America. And yet, according to the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, um, we're ranked 50th out of the world's industrialized nations for health. And that covers every single health marker, including infant, inf infant mortality. Um, it's actually very disappointing to think that we actually, in this country, consume 80% of the world's drugs, and yet we're only 5% of the world's population. There's something really me messed up there. Well, I think that speaks to our media. Because uh, if you watch most shows, they're sponsored by, by you know, some sort of pharmaceutical company. Yes, we're one of only two countries in the world that advertises medications. Uh, yes. And it does make a major difference. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually, the average American takes four medications, and we consume 90% of its opioids, and yet 60% can become addicted after only nine doses in a row. Mm -hmm. um, it's really terrifying. And it, it is terrifying, and it, there's so many doctors are so quick to prescribe. I had a bite in the garden a couple of uh, years ago, and I went in. I I had ended up with a rash, and uh, like a bullseye rash. So the bite marks were yes. under my arm, and my breast had a bullseye rash. Well, at first it was like, oh no, you've got shingles. Let's put you on, you know, on prednisone for the pain. I'm like, I'm not having pain. <laughs> I have itchy, you know, and and because of this bullseye, I think I may have been bitten by a tick. Oh no, no, no. The, so so it was. The first thing they did was give me opioids, and I'm like, well, I, I don't need this. Um, and then it took a couple of additional trips and me being very insistent. I think, you know, then it was like, oh, you need a mammogram because you've got a rash on your breast. Hello, I come from a medical background. <laughs> this is not something to do with my breast. This is a superficial bullseye rash. I insist on being tested for Lyme, and I, I did it, was positive for Lyme. But they are very quick to just give out the opioids for can uh, candy. 
Well, you know, I can't completely fault them because to me it's like if you go to a carpenter, everything looks like a nail because mm-hmm. they have a hammer as their tool. Right. And the medications are their tool that they're trained in. Um, unfortunately, we have to recognize something. Medicine is for emergency care. It's not for your average everyday things. And we have somehow placed them in this cultural authority level that they know everything. And mm-hmm. if they tell you something, they're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, they're human just like we are. Right. And they're trained a certain way, and not necessarily to understand that they're, they're emergency health care people. And sometimes that becomes a problem. And we do need the emergency care absolutely. on occasion when we need it. It's wonderful to have them. But on a regular basis, there's so many other, we used to say alternative, I call it complementary, holistic care providers. I even, I even avoid both those words yes. because I find there's two, like you're saying, it's apples and oranges. There's a necessity for medicine, but there's a necessity for other types of care too. Right. And I don't know if they necessarily complement the use of drugs. My mother, who was a nurse, used to say that all the time that she had the best of both worlds. And yet, I think ironically, it's not the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Complementary care or holistic providers are going to encourage you to have different supplements or change your diet, change. I'm getting into what you're going to talk about, so back to you. Well, also to continue what I was saying, (coughs) according to the Mayo Clinic, um, only one adult in 100 practices the most of the habits that are essential to good health, and only two others practice some of the habits. That means 97% of us are not doing the things that we need to do to be healthy. That's true. And we've been brainwashed into believing there's a pill for every ill Mm -hmm. and that side effects are like Russian roulette. I've always gotten a kick out of that. Like if you listen to the television commercial and they start talking about side effects, it makes it like, well, you might possibly get this when ironically everybody gets something. Mm -hmm. It's because they're trying to alter the, the function of the body in a very dramatic, difficult way the body has to react to. Well, the other piece of that is if they're on four different medications, how do those medications interact with each other? So there might be side effects with one medication if you're taking it on its own, but now let's just, let's blend them all in a pot. And, and you know, you, if you, you know that if you blend certain things in a chemistry experiment, you're going <laughs> to have an explosion. So we've got these different um, drugs that are interacting with each other in our bodies that are causing even more damage, and people are not aware of that. Exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. Exactly. We're, we're raised to believe that medication is what keeps us getting older, but ironically, in a lot of ways, it's what s- prevents us from getting older. And I think we have some natural pitfalls when we think about our health. One is that people oftentimes say, well, that's okay. I believe in everything in moderation. Mm-hmm. And ironically, what that really means is nothing. That you know, they, they, don't, they, they just live their life normally and think, well, I'm doing everything moderately. It's okay. I can drink this much. I can do that much. And yet, ironically, there's no logic to what they're doing because they think, well, I'm doing it in mo- moderation. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, especially going back to talking about the idea of taking medication, we've been raised to think one size fits all, that, oh, you have high blood pressure. This is what you need to do. Oh, you have this. And ironically, we all have a different body chemistry. We all have a a lot of differences about ourselves that one size does not fit all. We have to deal with that in a different way. We have to recognize, yeah, there are things that happen to us that's because of our unique chemistry and our unique bodies. And our, and our exposure levels. Some of us have been exposed to different types of si- uh, situations. I know myself, I'm highly, highly sensitive to anything chemical. And that's because I lived in the field of ultrasound exposed to glutaraldehyde in an enclosed room for years you know, with transducers, and this is before we used a lot of gloves. So I was washing the, these transducers and glutaraldehyde. I now have extreme chemical sensitivity because of what I did to myself. Again, <laughs> some of these stupid, irrational things that w- we don't realize at the time have long-term side effects. So my chemistry is very different than than somebody else's. Absolutely, and like you're saying, it's not stupid because we just don't know better. Exactly. And the interesting thing is, this information doesn't always get out there. Right. And it's like when we think about the COVID and we say, did anybody ever talk about vitamin D or some of these natural, easy things we could do that could help us yes. to, if not av- avoid it, to at least handle it better? Mm-hmm. And you don't hear that. All you hear about is washing your hands or right. avoiding people or wearing barriers that we somehow think are going to help us. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, another pitfall we have is we misunderstand pain. We're constantly right. running away from pain thinking, oh, it's, it's the enemy. Oh, please, anything. I'll do anything to get a night's sleep. Give me something I just don't want to have. And the irony is we have pain for reasons. Pain is 
it's like that light switch in, an, in a car when your oil is out. You don't want to just ignore it. You don't want to cover it up. You want to figure out why are we having pain and what is it doing? Mm-hmm. And one of the things the pain is actually doing is it's communicating to your body, let's release the proper chemicals, the, the um, prostaglandins, the norepinephrines, all the different things that we need to heal uh, to release them to that location. And when we're taking things to quit, quit that signal, we're actually affecting the physiology of our body in a negative way. It's the same thing with fever. A fever is the body telling you that there's some. I, I'm releasing chemicals to fight whatever is is invading, and what we do is we bring the fever down, which then we stop the invading <coughs> cell, you know, blood cells that are helping to to balance and to heal. So yes, there's a certain point where okay, now th- it's a little too high, too long, but a little fever is just the body trying to. The bodies are amazing. Again, coming from 40 years and as a diagnostician and seeing things like the liver regenerate itself. When people have had liver cancers and they've had l- part of their liver removed and I would scan them over a period of time, the liver will absolutely regenerate its own tissue. It is, the bodies are absolutely fascinating to me. If, t- if we nurture them and care for them, I often say we take better care of our cars than we do our bodies absolutely and we def- and also we define health in funny ways because as you were just saying you can be healthy and have a fever just like if you threw up if you ate something that was really disagreeable and did that the first thought we have is, oh my gosh i'm sick i'm throwing up but the irony is our body's doing what it was supposed to do is it's expelling something that shouldn't have been in there in the first place right. yeah or like our cats that expel their fur balls <laughs> <laughs> I, I prefer not <laughs> not to think about us having fur balls, but yes. Well, if we're if we're grooming ourselves and we're, we're bringing <laughs> fur in, you know, that's what they do. My tongue's so. not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but again, you don't think that they're sick when they, you know, it's just okay. It's a, you know, you Absolutely. initially you might think, is there something wrong? And then you realize, no, no, it's just a fur ball. But again, we have to look at every single is situation unique to that that point in time and it's not like you're saying it's not one size fits all exactly and finally we have to recognize something else health is not a birthright everybody seems to think well i'm meant to be healthy and why at the age of 50 did i all of a sudden get cancer or did these bad things occur and the reason is to, to a chiropractor very obvious it's a privilege it's not a birthright there are things we have to do to be healthy and it's not that simple i mean it does take some discipline and some effort but it's well worth it, and it's, it actually makes your life more enjoyable when you do those things. And one of the things that the guides have said is, in the, the archangels said that our, the newer generations are less healthy than older generations because the older generations didn't have the toxic chemicals in the food, the water, the air, and they exercised, I mean, just daily play. When, when I was a kid, we were playing, you know, tetherball on the, and hopscotch on the playground. And nowadays, so many kids are not out playing. We would play kick the can until the lights went off outside. And nowadays, k- kids are more latchkey. They're Absolutely. not. They're, it's a different. They're growing up differently, exposed to different chemicals. A- and then again, how many inoculations, which is a whole other subject. Absolutely. But those things affect the overall chemistry of the children, of, of people growing up today. So our generation is um, less healthy than my parents' generation who lived through the Great Depression, but they actually had food. A lot of what we're eating is not true. It's bioengineered. That's what it says right on the label, bioengineered. It's not real food. Um, So, yeah. There's so many different things also. And uh, basically, I did want to talk about, I believe there were eight pillars to being healthy. And the first one is, I think, our diets. And yeah. our diets involve what we eat, but also what we drink. And um, there was a national survey of U.S. adults done recently, and it found that excessive drinking has increased 21% since the pandemic. And it estimates that it, that is the cause of 8,000 additional fatalities. A- excessive drinking of alcohol. Yeah. Okay. And also, we're also having an excessive intake of sugar. Mm-hmm. And sugar is the number one inflammatory food that we can possibly put into our bodies. Um, many people start their day with very sugary sweets and sugar-laced mm-hmm. uh, caffeinated drinks. And I, I, I've seen a commercial on television for a, a hotel chain in which they show a breakfast food that they, they offer. And it's nothing but, you know, the typical uh, sweet things that are laced with lots and lots of sugar. Mm-hmm. And 
um, making it look like it's a great way to start the day, and it isn't because it sets us up for hyper and hypoglycemic swings, which basically means that our body, particularly our pancreases, are overworking to the point that for a short period of time, you get a burst of energy, and for a long period of time, you get a crash, which really is traumatizing right. the way your chemistry works. And sugar, they say, is more addictive than cocaine or heroin or whatever. It's very, very addictive. Absolutely, I know and, I, I, and I'm guilty of it as well. Yes. And one, one of the things I, I find is it's responsible for wrinkles, excess weight. Wrinkles, oh no. Joint pain, <laughs> depression, diabetes, and even cancer. Mm. Um, also, white flour. And white flour is something we eat too much of. Mm -hmm. And... It, we can also find in things like white flour, we find the pretzels and all those empty calories, chips and snack foods. And they're, they're simply calories we're eating that are not giving us any value whatsoever, as, as our junk food junkie yeah. guy was, was talking <laughs> right. about. And, yeah. um, you know, the, basically, um, also with the white flour, we're also talking about diet sweeteners, which are probably one of the worst things we can possibly have. And how many people... Do you see it at like a fast food place or something, getting the Diet Coke, and you see they're quite obese? Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the body is not satisfied with the chemis chemicals they're getting in the body. It keeps saying, I'm hungry. I'm not getting food. I'm not getting real food. And that happens also with fractionated foods such as egg whites. The body was meant to eat the entire food. Mm. It, skim milk, all these things that we, I'm going to use the word bastardized. We've changed them into things that aren't healthy products. And the body's constantly craving real products and actually you right. end up overeating exactly because there was a you know when i was younger and and still i do see a lot of people drinking diet coke and diet pro or diet products and i never quite liked the taste of it but early on i learned about the um the nutritional val depleted value of anything with aspartame in it and that it it fools the body into thinking that it's your it's, a, it's supposed to fool the body into thinking that it's something sweet, but the body inherently knows that that is not real. Just like margarine, if you put that out in the sun, you know, it, it's, it, sometimes it doesn't even melt. It's not, it's not a real product. It's petroleum. So a lot of this stuff, the body recognizes this is not Absolutely. real. Better to have real sugar, cane sugar, than it is to have the aspartame. But um, it's really important. I, I wanted to comment also. My husband was telling me that we only drink water at, at, at coffee in the morning, but water, we don't, we haven't had sodas in forever. And he was at work and they had a bunch of sodas left over from a gathering. And so he decided to have a ginger ale. And when I met him years ago, he, he used to drink ginger ale. And he said, I, I couldn't even finish the can. He said it was so sweet. He could taste the sweetness Absolutely. in it. When you get off of some of these, again, it's, it's weaning off because it's a habit weaning off of it then you're then you will recognize when you're taking too much of it it's like ugh. but um that uh, stuff is just all pure like in a in a can of soda it's something like two or three cups of sugar absolutely or some, some, no, some an nonsense. unbelievable amount yeah and also like you're saying i find for myself because i can become addicted to sugar as well mm -hmm. and, and when i have my stretches that i'm not eating sugar it doesn't even appeal or taste well to me. Mm -hmm. But then when I get back into the bad habit, mm -hmm. it becomes tempting again. It's very, very fascinating yes. how the body does that. And people think sometimes, well, I'm craving that. It's got to be good for me. But think about that. We can crave, if we take it, cocaine or things that mm -hmm. actually are addictive and bad for us, the body is very interesting that way. So we have to be careful in what we accept. Absolutely. That's what we can Discernment. Accept. Yes. It's one of my big words these year, and this year. <laughs> and another subject is dairy products. Yes. Dairy products are not good for us. We're the only species that consumes the lactation product of another species even after we've been weaned off of our own lactation products. And uh, what we find is we lack the, the bovine uh, enzymes that it takes to take in the calcium and all the wonderful things we're told that we're supposed to be getting from those milk products. And ironically, they do the opposite. We, we don't mm. get the calcium. We actually leach calcium from our bones from that. Mm. And what is fascinating is if you think about it, what does a cow eat to get all this calcium into their milk? They eat grass. Mm -hmm. And look at elephants with these giant calcium-filled tusks that they have. They're herbivores. They, they mm -hmm. don't even eat meat or anything dairy, and yet the calcium is coming there. So it does tell us that calcium is not just from milk, even though we seem to have been brainwashed into believing from the dairy industry mm -hmm. that we have to have dairy. Right. And then what about cheese? I mean, th again, that's a dairy product. Exactly. <clears throat> and I understand goat's milk is closer to the, the human um, milk product 
So. I, I believe that too. But I, again, I think the least milk products we can do, the better off I we see. are. Okay. And yeah. also phytonutrients. Um, people seem to have an aversion to eating vegetables and fruits nowadays. And it seems that that's something that people just don't do. And the irony is if you want to have something that is a quote-unquote cancer fighter, the phytonutrients in the vegetables is the best way to go. And we should be eating at least five or six helpings of some kind of vegetable or fruit every day. And people seem to be avoiding those. You know, I saw a, video, a little video clip the other day of these two little girls in in the garden. And they were, you know, one was eating a cucumber, just <coughs> you know, just eating the cucumber like it was candy. And the other was eating a uh, tomato, just biting into it. And, you know, just fresh from the garden, just getting, just eating, be teaching them that this, this is your, this is your candy. It's nature's candy. It's nature's candy, absolutely. And also, finally, even if we had a perfect diet, which I doubt if any of us do, it's very difficult to maintain that, we have to consider some kind of supplementation. And particularly the three that I recommend the most are omega-3 fatty acids, magnesium, and vitamin D. Um, we have to realize one other thing about diets. There's always a fad diet out there, something that everybody is doing right now. One of the ones that I hear a lot about now is called intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And while there's some logic to intermittent fasting, there's also some problem with it. Everybody's different. Some people respond wonderfully to that. I find for myself, I can intermittently fast, and what will then happen is when I finally do eat something, it opens a floodgate. Absolutely. And I actually overeat because yeah. I, I, my body was hungrier than I realized. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say always look at them with a, a careful eye and recognize that what is perfect for one person isn't necessarily exactly. perfect for another person. And there are some people who swear by eating six small meals a day. And if that's fine for their body, exactly. then do that. It's, again, everybody's body is unique. And it also depends upon their um, exercise load. I, I know I sit a lot in my world. So if I were to eat six meals a day, that would be a lot. You know, my I need to, bal to balance my intake with my... Um, burning of the calories. But that also brings us into the second pillar of health, there we exercise. Go. Yeah. I call it vitamin X. <laughs> and exercise is an amazing product. <coughs> it's the one product that has absolutely no bad side effects as long as you're using common sense with it, and yet it increases our energy level, it common increases sense our is fitness the key. level. Common it's a sense. wonderful experience, but <laughs> common sense is the key. And I'll be the first to admit, I call myself Dr. Hypocrite because that is one thing that I don't always do in, in, in moderation, and it is something that we should do. But I think we need to do three different types of exercise in the course of a week. We need some cardiovascular activity, which could mean walking for 20 to 30 minutes consecutively, three to four times per week. We need some kind of weight-bearing exercise to maintain muscle tone and also to keep us from um, bone de depletion. What we found was we have done a lot of studies on, especially we started with postmenopausal women, but then we extended to postmenopausal men and also to younger people. What we discovered was every year we have a certain amount of bone, bone density loss that can be prevented from doing simple weight-bearing exercises. And the weight-bearing exercises that they did, three times a week, they, they took Campbell soup cans, and they used them for three different types of exercise. They did bicep curls, they did tricep extensions, and they did overheads, um, three sets of 10, three times a week. And they found that that actually not only halted the loss of bone density, actually tended to increase it. So that's mostly for upper body, though. Well, you can, do it, you can do other types of exercise, but that was the one that they used for th that particular okay. study. Yeah. Um, also, we need flexibility exercise. I tend to love yoga, but that's mm -hmm. for me. But what I find is when I go stretches without doing this, when life gets in the way, I find I actually lose some of the flexibility that I had gained. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would basically say is uh, we, we need to make sure that we're doing minor stretches and movements uh, in the course of the day. Look at our animals. Our cats get up and they do the cat, you know, they, exactly. they'll stretch. Dogs do the same thing. When they get up after they've been laying someplace for a prolonged period, they stretch. So so I've been mir mimicking my cat. If my cat's going to stretch, I'll get up and I'll stretch with her. You <laughs> know, <laughs> She's teaching me. And, and as well, movement is really critical for the body because if you look at our spine, which is to a chiropractor, one of the very, very most critical parts of our body, the blood supply stops at the age of 17. And at that point, the circulation in the spine comes from your lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system does not have a heart to pump it. It simply moves by gravity. And you get more reaction as you're showing some degree of flexibility and motion than you would any other time. So it actually helps keep us younger and more flexible. So the movement, the muscular movement, is what milks or m transmits the lymphatic 
fluid through our body. Exactly. Right? And, keeps, and also the reason for having lymphatic movement as well is that's the thing that cleans all the horrible things that we produce when we're being insulted by some type of an, an infectious antigen. Um, right. The lymphatic system is what is the, is that's our fighter. Exactly. Yes. Major part of the immune system. Mm -hmm. And that brings us into our third pillar, which mm -hmm. is sleep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as you were saying, sitting, we have used the phrase, it's our new, st it's our, sitting is the new um, smoking. It's, right. it's not necessarily a healthy thing. And unfortunately, we have so many sitting jobs and occupations mm -hmm. that we don't get a chance to move enough. And under any kind of stress, what happens is our bodies activate something called the fight, flight, or fright mechanism. And basically, it, it comes from prehistoric days when, you know, we really had things to be afraid of. We had saber-toothed tigers. We had, um, we had to hunt for our foods. We had to really react. And so whenever a stress came up, the body would activate its adrenal glands to create adrenaline and all the different chemicals of hustle and, and run. So you could either run away or run toward or do whatever you had to do. Right. Nowadays, our stresses are things like, oh, it, oh my gosh, I'm late for this appointment. I've just got to get this. But the things you pick up the telephone and you straighten things out, it's not a physical thing. But the body doesn't separate physical one way or the other. Right. So we're still producing all that adrenaline. We've got all this energy in our bodies. And the law of conservation of matter and energy says you've got to do something with this energy. So what the body does is it takes the largest muscle groups and it tenses them. It tenses first between the shoulder blades. So it, and everybody says, well, that's my first stress point. And, and the lower back and the jaw, all these muscle groups start to tighten. Now, there's a point in time where you've tightened so much you can't tighten anymore. Mm -hmm. I always think of... For all the older people, the old I Love Lucy episode in which Lucy and Ethel were working in a candy store, and the candy kept coming faster and faster, and they couldn't do their hiding and stuff, but you could just see the stress building up. And when stress builds up, you've got to burn it off. And mm -hmm. the best way to burn it off is from movement, number one. But also, we need, we need to dissipate that energy. Once we've dissipated it, we then need to rest, because the problem is when we're in all this energy and tension, we're in something called sympathetic mode. Mm -hmm. The nervous system has two different levels, essentially on and off. The, when we're in sympathetic dominant, which is our most everyday level, we're, we're in the ready to run, ready to attack, ready to act. Then when we're in what's called parasympathetic, it's the opposite. We're ready to rest. We're ready to digest. And we need to be in parasympathetic more often. That's when we have something called heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a major test of our health. What happens is if our heart can't change its paces, we're going to have problems. For example, if you need to run, it's not there to pick up. And if you need to rest, it's not there to slow because down. Because it's already moving at a high speed. Exactly. I see. Which creates a lot of stress and tension in the body. Mm. So basically what we need to do is we need to get some rest. We need to find a way to get our bodies to sleep. And most of us don't turn our bodies off well at night. Right. And one of the big reasons is technology. Mm -hmm. And what I oftentimes tell people about is that there are things we can do about technology. One of them is we can turn it off 30 to 60 minutes before we go to sleep. Right. We can not have it in our bedrooms. We can do different things. One of the things that I, I highly recommend is wearing red-tinted glasses. There's a company that I use called Blue Blocks. It's capital B-L-U, small B-L-O-X. And I, I got a pair of red glasses to wear because the red color works off that, the blue light that suppresses our melatonin. And melatonin is the, the chemical of relaxation and sleep. And so the blue light, that's what's, in our L that's what's in our LED, that's what's in our devices that we're all looking at, be it the computer, our phone, our tablets. Uh, I know uh, as a hypnotist, that's one of the things that people come to see me for is the inability to sleep. Their minds are just going so fast that they can't slow it down. And then also they're on these devices that, that stimulate the the body and they can't sleep so yes get exactly. all those devices out of your room you know basically make your your room like a cocoon of of without the emf without all of those other external sources and and really um, have a ritual to get yourself some sleep my husband says i've never known anybody that sleeps as much as you do because i'm usually <laughs> asleep i have i have my pre-bed nap on the couch like starting from eight or nine and then i wake up at midnight and actually go to bed but um, it, it is I I get good sleep, and that I really am grateful for. Um, a lot of people wake wake up in the middle of the night and unable to get back to sleep. Their mind ruminates, and that's what I tell people. It's a good time to pray. 
how, see how many people you can send a prayer, send lights and love to in the middle of the night instead of, oh, my God, I can't get back to sleep. And then your mind says, okay, then don't get back to sleep. But if you sit there, if you lay there and just think all good thoughts and think um, all of the, think about sending love to all the people that you know, it's amazing how the body will just slowly, slowly, slowly just fade right back off to sleep. It really works if you train your mind to do that. But that's one of the big sleep interrupters is is that stressor. I, I've got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. You know, and then it interrupts our sleep, and then then it interrupts our functioning through the day. They did another study talking about how darkness in the room. Yes. And the room needs to be dark. If the room isn't dark, the melatonin doesn't get produced, and you don't get the same quality of sleep. Right. So it's very, very important to so not what I have lights. What I do is I have little night lights, like in the bathroom, that you don't have to turn on the light. The night light will be like a little runway. for The, like the planes have the runway lights. So y- I have l- the little four-watt LEDs, our, our light bu- um, night lights stationed throughout the house so that I don't have to turn on a light. If I do need to get up in the middle of the night, I can f- see my way through without turning on bright light. And the bedroom has none, so I can go back into the cocoon and sleep in the darkness. But that's another really big thing, is to avoid turning on a bright light, because you're right, it will then stimulate you, and it will, be m- it will make it harder to go back to sleep. And, and bringing us into our fourth pillar, mm-hmm. which is community. Mm. And nowadays, especially where we've talked about six-foot distancing for so long, wearing masks to hide from each other, we're not getting that social element that we all need and crave. And I, I took a quote from a gentleman named Brian Clement, who was the co-director of the Hippocrates Health Institute in West Palm Beach. And he said, quote, a lot of the reason people are sick is because they lack intimacy, touch, and tenderness. And I wanted to add in community, touch is a very important thing. And there have been many cross-cultural studies, especially back in the 60s and 70s, that demonstrate that Societies which provide infants with a great deal of physical and bodily contact produce relatively nonviolent adults. Because mm-hmm. our brains, they really do require f- co- contact. They require touch. And when I say touch, we're not touching each other's brain, but right. we are touching each other. And, and we this need is where the pets come in, too, because absolutely. the pets will allow, give you the opportunity to pet. To, to y- They will touch you, and, and it gives you something to connect with, even if you don't have... A person in your life on a regular basis to touch but uh, you're right we must feel a sense of kind touch gentle and touch. well there are two types of touch that i was going to talk about yeah one is that tender physical contact given with respect and warmth and the other one is an emotional contact it's not even touching each other but it's given tacitly simply from being attentive and caring for each mm. other and as i w- had also written in here that i want to say is sort of what you were just saying is if you've ever shared your life with a dog mm-hmm. you've experienced firsthand that it's love of physical contact they love to be touched mm-hmm. they recognize that energy and the feeling that you get from touching them because it stimulates their mechanoreceptors and it excites their brain tissue it signals love and caring and we all need to feel appreciated and loved it's a, probably the two most basic human needs mm-hmm. and touch allows our electromagnetic fields to intermingle and when a field become uh, into proximity, it, it creates a form of acceptance that's really valuable for us. I oftentimes talk about if you've ever been to a party and you've s- been socializing, all of a sudden there's one person you just feel very uncomfortable around, mm-hmm. you recognize that our uh, electromagnetic fields are vibrating at a very different level. Mm-hmm. And conversely, there's that person you just feel drawn to, and it's the same thing. Their magnetic level vibrates with our level, and it right. draws us over to them. And the other, another important thing about touch is the ability to set boundaries. And that's the thing with, again, I I'm, I have cats. So they will come up when they're wanting to be pet and they will let you know. But if you go to pet them and they're, they're, they're wanting some quiet time, they will also <laughs> let you know. They teach you how to set boundaries. So sometimes it is important if you're around somebody that, that is crossing your boundaries, that is, that is un- that's making you uncomfortable, it is okay to push back, to say no, to protect yourself from negative touch as well. Well, well absolutely. And also, in community, the one of the other important things is to recognize you want to be with people that are optimistic and not pessimistic, which we'll be getting into as we go along here. Sure. Um, but also, I was talking about, if you ever have been in a hospital where the nursery is, when a baby is a certain level to the mother, it's very comfortable. And as soon as you get just a distance away where their electromagnetic fields are no longer touching, the baby will start to cry. Interesting. And it, the mother has a calming influence just from the electromagnetic field alone. Mm-hmm. 
So our fifth pillar is thoughts. And thoughts are really things. And if our friends spoke to us the way our internal mind speaks to ourselves, they wouldn't be our friends very long. Exactly. Because we're so self-critical all the time. Mm -hmm. And we focus on things that aren't important. Oh, the little mistakes we make in the course of the day that everybody would make, we multiply. We make ourselves feel very bad for things that we should not be doing to ourselves. And as soon as we've done that, our vibration, the thing I was just talking about, that electromagnetic field, it goes down. And the lower your vibration, the lower your health level. The higher vibration, and you've seen these people, they're the people that are smiling, that you get drawn to because their energy level and their mm -hmm. health is just so much better. You, you want some of that, and that's mm -hmm. because that's what we all want and we crave. Absolutely. And, and that's um, one of the things that, that I do a lot of work with is helping people to shift their thoughts. It really Absolutely. is important because the level of thoughts, um, negative thoughts are a different, they have a different vibrational energy level. And those negative thoughts will absolutely pull you down. So it, you have to sometimes work at shifting that, especially if we've been programmed to think negatively about ourselves. How many times do we look in the mirror and go, oh, you are this or you are that? If you were to look at yourself in the mirror and go, y you know, yay, good, jo good job. This was awesome. You got this. It shifts your energy. And, and then you're able to help shift others because you're not able to help others if your energy is really down. Absolutely. So we, this is part of that community and how thoughts translate. When we associate with pessimists and downers, it lowers our vibration, it lowers our health level. And when we use negative words such as, I will not procrastinate, your brain really hears, I will procrastinate, because exactly. the word not doesn't come through. And so ironically, what we need to do is reframe those kind of phrases. And one of, the, I was writing his, one of the things we could say is we need to talk in positives such as, I will deal with issues efficiently and promptly as they come along. Mm -hmm. And that will work. But if we say, I will not procrastinate, we'll procrastinate. That's right, because it's what you're telling your mind, because mind does not hear the word not. Absolutely. So, yeah, so I'll procrastinate. Okay, self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. We've, we're going to do that. <laughs> and, and our sixth pillar mm -hmm. is purpose. Uh, having purpose is absolutely critical. It gives us a reason for waking up and a sense of satisfaction. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about was it funny thing. Did you ever notice, like, if you bought a new car or you bought these things, you thought it's going to make me happy? And it doesn't really make you happy. I mean, there's that satisfaction you first bought the car, but that was it. But if you had to help somebody fix this car or if you were to work in the garden or do something physical, all of a sudden you start realizing a, a feeling of satisfaction and mm -hmm. happiness that you don't get from things or from purchases. And it's very, very important to recognize that we all need to purpose. We all need purpose. Things that also involve things like helping others and being charitable and doing good deeds. And basically, Viktor Frankl wrote, he, when he was talking about Holocaust survivors, he said that those who have a way to live, they survive the how, mm -hmm. all the difficulties. And it makes sense. We really need to focus on our purpose and take advantage of that. That doesn't mean you have to work like a dog night and day. The Puritan ethic isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm basically talking about is just having a reason and having something to be focused on and excited about. And so many people in our society are working day and night in order to buy things. And that's what we've been programmed to. It, it's all about purchasing more, 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 bigger, better. Like gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, <laughs> we <don't>, yeah, <laughs> don't even want to go there. We, you have too many, you have two more topics. We're not going to talk gasoline today. <laughs> okay. okay, although I will say one thing about that. I did see something funny on Facebook where somebody said, basically, um, I don't like to brag about buying expensive things, but I was at the gas station recently. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I asked my husband, I saw one that said, I, I asked my husband to take me to get me something expensive, and he, he took me to the gas station, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's terrible. And so purpose number, number seven is alignment, and that's where the chiropractor comes into play. And one of the things we talked about with diet was that you can't exercise out a bad diet. You can't over-exercise to fix a diet. But you also can't do the things to fix your alignment as well. And our skeletal system has three functions to it. It supports our posture, it protects the insides, and it allows for flexibility. And when you think about it, the support and the flexibility kind of contradict each other. And if we didn't have that flexibility when we were to bend over, we couldn't stand up again very easily. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have that. But the flexibility also gives us the possibility that we can become subluxated, which means we can get up joints out of alignment in such a way that it affects us. Mm -hmm. And the way subluxations affect us is they impede what's called the mental impulse. The mental impulse is that message between the brain and the body that tells it what to do. Okay, stomach, time to digest. Okay, this, 
and vice versa. Okay, the stomach is telling the body, okay, I, I've got something in here. What should I be doing? Oftentimes those messages are like if you got a letter in the mail and it was raining so bad the letter got soaking wet and you're looking at the words and saying, there's a the and there's a word. I can't quite get what this one is. And so we somehow need to keep our bodies so well aligned that these mental impulse messages are working properly. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what a chiropractor does. Basically, what is fascinating, and I do like to let people know when they come into the office that I have never, ever, ever found an adult that has never been to a chiropractor to be in proper alignment. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a function of life that yeah. we get out of alignment. Getting, being born, you know, coming through that tiny little Absolutely. hole, you know, crimps our neck and, and falling off the merry-go-round back when we had merry-go-rounds, which was one of my favorite <laughs> things to do. But just the, just different life things cause our bodies to get out of out of alignment. So it's, it, it, I, I'm a firm believer and I have been for many years. We talk about timing, yes. toxicity, and thoughts. And what that basically means is that timing can be a stressful thing. You walk and you miss a step or you right. do things. Toxicity can be something that you didn't agree with your body and just reacted to it. And thoughts is probably the major cause of subluxations because, for example, if I'm driving my car and somebody behind me honks his horn, my first thought is, what did I do wrong? Is everything okay? So you I tense, tense up. Yep. And it, it builds up over time. Yeah. And one last one because we've got two yeah. minutes left. Well, that's perfect. We made it to number eight. Yeah, number eight is spirituality. Yes. And that goes back to what you've been writing about and talking about mm -hmm. for forever. Yes. And in, in your Chronicles of Hope books, spirituality is probably one of the most important elements of being healthy and functioning. You know, when we recognize we're part of something far greater, it's an infinite concept that we have to recognize that whether or not we believe in a creator or one God, we have to believe there's something greater about this universe. Yes. Everything fits together so well and so beautifully. And our finite minds can't completely comprehend this, which is where your books come into play mm -hmm. because you let go of the finite mind. Right. And letting go of the finite mind is a very complex thing to do. And not everybody has that gift. And I believe we don't have that gift because we went to, to public school. And public <laughs> school taught us It was trained out of us. Yes. Yeah. The Rene Descartes, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's not really true. So to truly understand spirituality, it includes another thing, practicing g gratitude, forgiveness, understanding, and respect. Mm -hmm. We have to walk in each other's shoes. Like, for example, if somebody cuts you off when they're driving by, Maybe they were so stressed out they didn't even see you. Or maybe there, they were in a rush to get to the hospital. There are so many we things that happen mm -hmm. that we have to understand that, okay, yeah, they kind of hurt my feelings, but maybe I wasn't looking at this from the proper viewpoint, right. and I will forgive that person for hurting my feelings. I won't necessarily mm -hmm. say I liked what they did, mm -hmm. but I can forgive them for that. And let it go. Because exactly. Because if you hold on to it, it only hurts you. Exactly. So how can we find you, Dr. Jim Peck? Um, well, my office phone number is 978-655-5217. Mm -hmm. My, the three of us, my daughter, my wife, and I practice in Andover, Massachusetts, and we're right off of Route 93. Very easy to get to. Yes. Very easy to get to. And uh, it's Chiropractic Wellness Center is the name of your exactly is name of your business, and it's harmonizing mind, body, and spirit, body, mind, and spirit. Here, and here. and I am a, a firm. I just I, I drive an hour to get there to see you, b because I am so impressed with the work that you do, and Thank and you. how sensitive you are to what my body needs when I've done something really I'm going to call it stupid <laughs> <laughs> bonk my head getting out uh, of the car you know uh, uh, what number was that on my level here <laughs> so, <laughs> we have to forgive so ourselves and not call ourselves do. stupid we well we it's I've done something, so, you know, <laughs> irrational shall exactly. we say I've it's, it's like it's irrational. like when you have a child and you say to them you're bad well you're no. not bad you did something you did that was something. bad but you're you're good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and we all do things that it, that we have consequences Absolutely. for. So we have people who can help us through life. So thank you so much, and thank you, listeners. Until next time, look up, stay positive, and be the light in someone's day. <laughs>